I think I think about philosophy a little bit like the way I think about the value of art in general. I kind of think about philosophy as a kind of art where um, we're sort of like being really creative in our solutions to puzzles. <laughs> uh, we're sort of exercising a certain kind of rational capacity and there's something just like valuable about that. And I think sometimes the product that we produce is also instrumentally valuable in other kinds of ways. Um, I think sometimes the product that we produce is just kind of beautiful, you know, we're just kind of theory building or exploring things in the world. And I think sometimes it can be both. And I think that's very analogous to the way I think about art. Welcome, everyone, to today's interview, where we are very pleased to welcome Professor Sukhani Hirji. She is Assistant Professor of Philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania. Her philosophical research focuses primarily on ancient philosophy, um, Aristotelian ethics, and, and contemporary ethics. Uh, she has a variety of, of published articles on these topics. Feel free to add anything, but with that, uh, welcome and thanks so much for being here, Professor Hirji. Yeah, thank you for having me. Awesome. So I wanted to uh, start with some questions about one of your papers on um, Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics uh, on acting virtuously. Yeah, and, sure. Yeah. You, so as I understand it, you look to um, resolve an apparent uh, inconsistency um, in his ethics. Um, by distinguishing virtuous actions from from acting acting virtuously, and right. um, so the main idea I take it is that an individual um, individual virtuous actions aren't really ends in themselves, but acting virtuously, you know, which itself will require some virtuous actions, um, is um, right. It, does it make sense to say that okay, the individual actions? Qua an exercise of virtuous character is an end in itself, or yeah, 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 yeah. or can you expand on the idea and, and, yeah. and how you how it resolves the apparent tension in, in Aristotle? Yeah, good. I mean, this is a great question, and partly you're sort of putting pushing me on like exactly what it means to say that virtuous actions and acting virtuously are somehow distinct when really there is just one sort of action issuing from a particular agent. Um, what I'm trying to capture in that distinction is actually a distinction I think Aristotle himself is drawing um, that you can sort of trace in the Greek. It's like a bit harder to, to see in translations. Um, but sometimes he talks about sort of acting well. So he uses these kinds of adverbial phrases. And then sometimes he talks about the actions themselves. So he talks about kind of discrete or concrete actions. Um, and what I want to suggest in that paper is that if we actually look carefully at when he's using these phrases, he seems to be picking out two different ideas. Um, when he's using these kinds of adverbial phrases, so when he's talking about acting virtuously, he seems to be talking about um, the way in which the activity reflects or expresses the character of the agent performing the action. So when you act justly, what it means to act justly is not just to do a just thing, but to do it from a just character. So you have all the kinds of like motivations and beliefs that a just person would have. Um, so that becomes important in a number of passages that, you know, ancient philosophers spent a lot of time agonizing over. Um, because I think if you sort of trace that distinction, it helps us make sense of a number of kind of important passages. And then as I suggest in the paper, it sort of helps with some, some broader um, philosophical issues that come up with Aristotle. So the one I focus on is thinking about how um, what an agent does when they perform a just action can be both an end in itself and then for the sake of some good end. So I think I use the example of a just action in the paper where you might um, stand up to a bully uh, and that might count as a just action. Uh, but we can distinguish between the case where you do the just action, but you don't do it from just motives. So you might stand up to a bully, but you only do it to get attention or to impress somebody around you or because you feel like you're obligated to. 
for Aristotle, those aren't really just motives. Um, by contrast, if you do the just action and you do it with a kind of full appreciation of the reasons that you have to do it, and if you do it also like desiring to do it, so having the right kinds of good motivations and you sort of take pleasure in the action that you're performing, that for me is not only an instance of a just action, but also an instance of acting justly, so acting virtuously. Um, so I think there is a distinction and that's sort of the way that I carve it out is like thinking about the character of the action itself in terms of the kinds of good ends or consequences that it aims to produce versus thinking about the activity in terms of partly how it reflects the character of the agent performing the action. And then part of what you're asking is like, okay, so like what exactly does this distinction amount to? So I see that there's some kind of distinction. Um, I take a part of what's behind your question is just like, metaphysically what's the difference between a virtuous action and acting virtuously and there in the paper i'm like a little bit um agnostic on that question so partly because i'm sort of doing an interpretive project where aerosol just doesn't say enough about the metaphysics of actions and how to think about this sort of metaphysical distinction i suggest at one point that we might use um the language that Aristotle often uses in this sort of context of the just action being sort of the same in number, but different in being from acting justly. So Aristotle has this kind of like metaphysical resource that he often appeals to where something can be at once the same and in some important respect, metaphysically different. So I sort of gesture at that as the way to think about this distinction. Um, but I don't uh have a lot more to say about that question about just the, so the sort of metaphysics of the action um again the real hope in the paper is just to capture so on the one hand to capture what i think is just a really um kind of frustrating apparent inconsistency in the way aristotle describes the relationship between actions and ends so part of the idea is like once we sort of track this distinction we can make sense of passages where he'll talk about virtuous actions as though they're for the sake of ends beyond themselves. And then we can also make sense of passages where he talks about acting virtuously as though it's an end in itself and choice worthy for its own sake. And I think there's just an important sense in which both things are true when a virtuous agent performs a virtuous action. And if we can see how both things are true, then we can kind of make progress on this question of, is Aristotle's theory fundamentally egoist? I think like in the sense that people are worried about, no. Um, in some sort of very broad sense, sure. So he thinks we should all try to be happy. And he thinks that if we live good lives and perform ethically good actions, we will be happy. But I think he thinks if you're performing just actions with the kind of, with your main motive being that you want to be happy and you want to do the things that are going to promote your happiness, you're sort of missing part of the explanation for why your just action is good. And so you're actually failing to act justly. You're failing to kind of fully engage your practical, rash, practically rational capacities. And the full engagement of those capacities, the kind of full expression or realization of those capacities is I think part of what constitutes happiness for Aristotle. So I don't know if that totally gets at your question, but that's at least what I'm trying to carve out in the paper. Yeah, yeah, I think so. That's, that's actually really helpful. And, and what you say there about, um, whether it's egoist, um, right? That is something you talk about in the paper, and because um, the, the, the idea that someone might have, I take it, is that look, the highest good, um, or however you phrase it, is you know eudaimonia, you know, happiness, or flourishing, right? And mm -hmm. um, if everything is like really ultimately in service of that highest good, then um, acting virtuously or whatever is in service of producing or contributing to your own happiness. And that sounds kind of egoist. And that's that interpretation you want to push back on? Or how, how do you kind of approach that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're really getting at sort of the heart of like the bigger project that I'm interested in, which is I think like, in a way, yes, um, the theory is egoist. And then in a way, no, it's not egoist. And specifically, I think some of the more sort of objectionably egoist ways that Aristotle's theory has been interpreted, I think are wrong. Um, so 
you know, part of what I'm thinking about now in Aristotle's theory is sort of distinguishing between two kinds of questions. So one question is um, what the structure of value looks like for Aristotle at a kind of metaphysical level. So what the relationship is between different kinds of goods that we should care about or are choice worthy, at least partly for their own sakes and the highest human good. And then, then on the other hand, this question of like, okay, in some particular instance, why should we perform a virtuous action? What should our goal be? Um, what makes the action good in some particular instance? And I think we actually really need to tease these questions apart because I think um, the structure of value for Aristotle is one where for human beings, so when we think about the kind of realm of human goods, I think eudaimonia really is at the top of the structure of value. So it really is the most valuable good. And every other good is choice worthy, at least in part, because it promotes eudaimonia in some way. I think to say that, you can sort of say that without thinking that the value of all goods in the ethical domain is somehow reducible to the ways that they promote happiness. And I think if you can capture that, um, you can capture how virtuous actions um, don't have to be, the value of virtuous actions doesn't have to be reducible to the way that they promote our own happiness. So we can kind of avoid this um, worrying idea that the reason we should be just or generous or courageous is because it's going to make us happy. I think that is one of the reasons. It just can't be the central reason, because I think if it's a central reason, we're kind of getting things wrong about the world. We're kind of like not seeing what's actually good about our actions in some particular instance. And if we're not seeing what's good about our actions in some particular instance, then we're sort of failing to engage in the activity that would actually be constitutive of our happiness. So an analogy that might be helpful is just the ways that people sometimes talk about hedonism and the sort of puzzle or paradox for hedonism, where um, if you think pleasure is the kind of fundamental good, you might think we should do everything in order to maximize our own pleasure. Uh, if you take that attitude towards a lot of things in the world, you probably won't be successful at actually maximizing your own pleasure. So if you thought like uh, you should go to a party and find some friends because it will give you pleasure, um, you're going to be focused on the wrong things. You're not going to value the friendships that you form for their own sake. And you'll fail to actually realize what is most pleasure giving about friendships. I think something sort of analogous is going on in the case of virtuous actions. Um, I think there's not a perfect analogy, but that sort of gives you a bit of the flavor for, I think, what's going on in Aristotle, where we can say on the one hand, uh, we should all want to be happy and we should all kind of orient our lives around the right conception of happiness. But given that the right conception of happiness is one where we're fully realizing our practical rationality, and where what it means to fully realize our practical rationality is to be responsive to the value of all kinds of things in the ethical domain, including the happiness of other people. I think um, we're not going to fully realize our own practical rationality by single-mindedly focusing on our own happiness and on the things that would promote that happiness. Yeah, that, that's that's very good. And, and I just want to add something on the previous thing about the distinction between virtuous actions and acting virtuously. I mean, intuitively to me, there has to be some sort of difference at least because I mean, virtuous actions are, you know, particular actions and, and acting virtuously isn't, uh, it seems to me. Um, so I don't know, maybe it's the, it's the activity of an agent considered at a higher level of abstraction or something. And, and maybe, maybe that, yeah. Maybe from there we can think about the significance. I, I'm not sure, <laughs> but maybe there's some way to think about it. No, good. I mean, I think something like that, right? I think something like that has to be right. And as you say, like we need some kind of a distinction like this, partly because Aristotle says that non-virtuous people can perform virtuous actions. And in fact, they kind of have to be able to perform virtuous actions because that's how they become virtuous. But non-virtuous people cannot act virtuously. They can't act in a way that is kind of expressive of a virtuous character. So I think Aristotle himself clearly is operating something like this distinction. And I think it's just a matter of sort of trying to processify it. And um, as, as you're sort of gesturing at, like trying to spell out a little bit of what the metaphysical picture is supposed to be. Right, and that's, that's a very good point that um, you can perform in principle virtuous actions without 
acting virtuously. So yeah, that's another way in which they right. definitely have to come apart. But spelling out how exactly they do is uh, is not uh, so easy. Um, right. <laughs> but but on on a sort of related note, kind of a a meta thing. Um, you know, an issue that com often comes up with when analyzing, you know, the views presented in earlier works and, and arguments and so forth, um, you know, you're trying to find that balance between, you know, the exegesis and, and your own philosophical theorizing. Like, in other words, um, right. sometimes yeah. we merely want to try to best understand what the author was saying, what they're trying to get across. Um, but other times we want to use the author's writing to construct the best theory or argument we can, even if it, you know, even if it differs from the author's original intent. I mean, do you think about this much? And if so, and how much of an, of an issue is it like in this work or in your work generally? Yeah, I mean, I love this question because I think it really is um, pinpointing something very deep about the discipline of ancient philosophy where I actually feel like um, most people in the field right now do some combination of the two things you're describing. And I actually think we're not always very good at identifying when we're doing the one thing versus when we're doing the other thing. And I think this is especially true of Aristotle scholars. I think in general, people are attracted to Aristotle, especially his ethical theory, because we think there's something kind of right about it that we're trying to understand better. And I think when that's your sort of interest in the theory, it becomes very easy to slip into wanting to find the version of the theory that you think might be true or plausible or attractive. And uh, that can sometimes be in tension with giving the most accurate interpretation of what we actually have in the texts. And I think it's a bit of a juggling act because the texts we're working with have, you know, a lot of people have read them and done a lot of really great philosophy on them. They're also very, some of them are in kind of rough shape. Um, there's no way for us to ever really know with certainty what Aristotle in fact thought. Um, and I think we, in general, approach the text from a kind of principle of charity where we want to um, try and reconstruct what we think is the most charitable and the most sort of sophisticated and plausible and coherent version of the theory that we see being presented. And I think that's always going to involve a little bit of <laughs> sort of like creativity and generosity. Um, and as you're saying, like, I think that uh inevitably um involves us to some degree offering up what we take to be the best theory where now we're sort of providing the kind of theory that we sort of hope to see in the author or would like to see um and so you know i, I think the best thing you can do when you're doing this sort of historical work is just to kind of be honest with yourself and aware of that problem i also I tend to think, you know, some, I think some ancient philosophers are sort of purists <laughs> where they think like, um, we should only really be doing kind of historical interpretation and we shouldn't really be trying to fit Aristotle's theory into a more sort of contemporary framework or to look to Aristotle's theory for answers to questions about contemporary ethics. I don't really personally, um, endorse that view at least for my own work um because i'm actually as you know like quite interested both in the history of philosophy and in contemporary ethical questions and my approach is to think that ancient ethical theories actually have quite a bit to say um to debates in contemporary ethics and i'm interested in that project i'm interested in bringing these two fields into conversation and to seeing what remains sort of exciting and relevant about ancient theories and also maybe like what ancient theories leave out. And so I really do sort of um, hope that my work can bring out some of the elements of these theories that I think are genuinely interesting and attractive and um, can inform at least in some, to some degree, uh, the ways that people think about some of these questions in contemporary ethics. So this is all to say, like, I think the tension you're describing is a real one. And I think especially if you're trying to bring ancient theories into conversation with contemporary ethical theorizing, I think it's sort of inevitable <laughs> that you're doing a little bit of both things. Um, one nice thing about the field is there, uh, people know these texts very well. And so if you're not, um, 
if you can't make an argument that's really text-based, uh, somebody will tell you <laughs> very quickly. Um, so I do think it's always a sort of constraint on historical work that you're kind of making sense of the actual text that we have. Um, I think there's another kind of work that people do where they're sort of less interested in that project. So they're kind of just taking, taking inspiration from the text, but not really taking themselves to be constrained by what Aristotle actually said. I don't, I haven't yet done that sort of work. So I really am, I take myself to be working in the tradition of ancient philosophy where it is just a sort of constraint on what I say in any paper that it can be kind of supported as much as possible by the text that we actually have. Yeah, I think I'm really on the same page on uh, on what you said there. I, got, I, I definitely think there's some use of sort of um, historical or ancient philosophy merely for its own sake or for like history. You know, you want to some interest in, in what ancient thinkers thought. Maybe there's some literary stuff to learn. Um, but it's it's focusing only on that seems pretty restricting. I mean, it seems to uh, you want might want to learn about how um, what you can actually learn from them in, in your modern theorizing. Maybe how you can situate mod, situate modern thought with respect to you know what came before it. Um, those sorts of things are are more contemporary values of, of, of ancient philosophy. And I think ignoring those or not putting in enough emphasis on those is, is to miss out on a, a lot of value. I think that's true. And I mean, for what it's worth, like I'm such a kind of pluralist about this stuff. Like I kind of think um, there's room for all kinds of different historical work, including work that is just sort of taking inspiration on the one hand to work that is really just about the text and the kind of historical context. I think the texts are incredibly rich. There are sort of really exciting philosophical ideas that clearly form the foundations of kind of Western philosophy as we do it now. So I, yeah, I, um, I don't think there's any right way <laughs> to be doing historical work. My hope for the field is that, you know, we can just let many flowers bloom. And um, I think there's, there's room and value for all kinds of different approaches. Do you think that, uh, like Aristotelian ethics or other um, views forward in ancient philosophy are very valuable to, to modern moral theorizing in that, like, I guess to put it one way, do, do you accept more or less his ways of thinking about, you know, virtues and, and so forth and, and goodness um, or, or, or not? Do you think it's yeah, less important? Right. Yeah. I mean, that's a good question. I don't, um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that I would say I accept his theories. Um, I'm not sure that I have some sort of clear philosophical orientation where I think there's some sort of normative ethical theory or meta-ethical theory that I think is true. Um, I'm really interested in sort of more specific questions and I'm interested in sort of like thinking about the framework that he has because I think it's really rich and it sort of pushes us to think about things in different ways. Um, so I wouldn't say I sort of like fully endorse it, but I do think there's a lot there that's really interesting. I mean, one thing that sort of came up a little bit in a previous question is, one thing I'm really interested in Aristotle's ethical theory is I think um, he's just not really interested in the question. And I think a lot of the kind of central questions that people now in normative ethical theories are really interested in. So I don't think Aristotle is, principally interested in the question of like what ought we to do or um what should sort of what principle uh or procedure should kind of guide our decisions or our actions i think he's much more interested in this kind of prior question of what does the structure of value in the ethical domain look like and i think that's really interesting so even aside from the answers that he's giving i think just what he takes to be the kind of central question of ethical theory is really fascinating. Um, and then I think, yeah, the, 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 um, his interest in trying to think about what it means to be a good person and how that relates to living a kind of good human life, which includes like a life that we enjoy and that we want to have. I think, you know, that question is sort of a perennial question and we still sort of agonize about it in contemporary moral philosophy. And in some ways, we were sort of more skeptical now than Aristotle was that it's a way for these things to be reconciled. And so I think just really trying to take seriously um, a sort of worldview in which these things don't have to be completely intention, that's very attractive to me. 
I think on the flip side, there's a lot that Aristotle is not thinking about. And I think it's sort of important to <laughs> be kind of um, aware of that as well. So, you know, his audience is a kind of small subset of pretty wealthy aristocrats in Athens, all of them men, all of them sort of um, of a kind of similar background and experience. And I think that it is a sort of limited perspective. So you never hear a serious conversation in Aristotle or in Platonic dialogues about what sort of life should be best for a woman and how it might compare to the life that's best for a man. Um, you don't hear a serious conversation about what virtues, how virtues might look different in different kinds of societies or contexts. And I think, you know, that that is just a sort of real limitation. And I think it's worth us being sort of like very honest <laughs> and interrogating those limitations. Um, but I think there's a lot to learn even from that. So I think the texts are incredibly rich. I think both the sort of positives, like what Aristotle is successful at doing, but then also I think what he's unsuccessful at doing or maybe overlooked. I think there's a lot that we can learn and sort of continue to learn um, from that. Partly because again, like I think when you look at the history of philosophy, the questions that people are asking are just kind of the big questions. Like they're asking the most sort of universal central questions about the human experience. And I don't think those questions are ever ones that we should be confident we've solved or kind of moved beyond. Awesome. Yeah, I, I very much agree with that. Um, one thing, though, I like got oftentimes we do think we are asking or and trying to answer the same questions, um, you know, because the words we use to express them are the same. But sometimes, sometimes we aren't. We're sick. Sometimes the the questions do change unbeknownst to us. And and this is actually a, a thought I had when reading um, uh, McIntyre's After Virtue, because there's there's this idea that like modern theorizing has sort of lost its way on ethics in some in some ways, kind of divorced itself from the historical context in which these issues arose. And um, well, that that's one interpretation, I guess. But the other is that the questions really have changed, even if the language hasn't, right? The the what things we associate with ethics and goodness and obligations um, aren't the things that were associated by those that came before, necessarily. No. And so I, like, I, I guess the question is, how do we determine whether um, we really are asking the same questions, trying to solve the same issues, or we're diverging even on that from, from those before? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I mean, I think I'm a bit more optimistic than you because I sort of think there's a way in which the questions haven't changed and there's obviously ways in which they have changed in important ways. I guess I think at the most general level, like at the level of the kind of motivations of the ancient Greeks, we can really, um see how we're asking versions of the same questions so you know when people like Kant and Sidgwick worry about the relationship between prudential reasons and moral reasons I think that is just a version of the kind of question that Plato and Aristotle are asking in their works um in trying to make sense of the relationship between virtue and happiness so I think the, the kind of like the very general level there really is a lot of overlap in the kinds of questions or the kinds of concerns that people have then I think at the level of the details, you're really right that it can be really tempting, and I think sometimes too tempting to see a lot of similarity or overlap. And I think that's where, um, I think that's a contribution of ancient philosophy. So I think people who really know the texts and spend a lot of time on those texts are actually well positioned to say where there is kind of overlap and where there's actually deep disagreement or difference. And I think that can often be really illuminating. So seeing the ways in which ethical questions or the ethical context has changed, I think that can be really helpful for seeing how nothing in philosophy is sort of fixed. And there's actually a huge influence um, had by the kind of context that we're in and the sorts of questions that present to us as urgent. And I think that's a healthy reminder, especially for analytic philosophers, because uh, I think a lot of us do work that tends to feel very ahistorical so we sort of act like <laughs> um, we're sort of inventing the wheel for the first time and we act like um, we're sort of disembodied rational creatures who are not in any way influenced by our surroundings or kind of ideology or our social context and I think when you read philosophy from different time periods or different places you really I think are forced to question that assumption to some degree because you just see how differently people um, approach 
approach questions in the same domain and how much that is explained by the kind of context that they're in. Yeah, that's that, that pretty, seems pretty sensible to me, actually. Yeah. Um, so, but it, it 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 does. There still is that fact that that there's. Um, yeah. Okay. We there's things that are perennial questions that we can be pretty confident we're talking about the same things, but um, there's a worry about how how much we can take that for granted. So we should be more careful. Right. Um, yeah, I think you know questions. for me. It's Right. I think just always being aware of uh, both. Yeah, I think being aware of that concern <laughs> goes a long way. I mean, that's sort of my answer to a lot of these questions is there are always risks to us sort of approaching these texts from our perspective and looking for kind of what we want to find in them. Um, but I think that's just sort of one of the necessary risks that comes along with getting what's valuable from them. Very good. All right. So uh, I may come back to stuff on uh, Aristotle or ancient philosophy, but I wanted to talk about one of your your other papers. And I found your discussion of achievement and difficulty to be quite interesting. Uh, cool. Um, your, yeah, your, yeah. Your criticisms of Bradford's account um, of achievement, you know, which are construed primarily in terms of, of difficulty, um, seem reasonable to me. Uh, so the key feature. Uh, I take it on your account is that um, the process, you know, test the limits of an agent's perfectionist capacities, where uh, perfectionist capacities are the those sort of characteristically human capacities which are intrinsically valuable. Um, do I have this roughly right? And uh, maybe can you expand a bit on your on your approach to what makes a, an achievement valuable, and I guess what the nature of achievements are. Yeah, good. I mean, this actually really connects up with the Aristotle paper that we just talked about. So I'm using a kind of similar um, move in this paper. Um, and the basic idea is, you know, so the perfectionist stuff, that's really, I'm trying to kind of grant Bradford the sort of underlying motivations of her account. So she takes herself to be a kind of perfectionist, where what that means is you think of the value of certain kinds of achievements in terms of how they express or realize basic human capacities and so in her view achievements are valuable because they are difficult and the reason that difficulty makes them valuable is because when something is difficult it allows an agent to fully realize or express her will and bradford's is kind of this nietzschean idea that your will is a sort of central human capacity and when you really kind of test the limits of your will or push yourself or do something really difficult or hard um that's valuable that's a way of kind of fully realizing some part of what you are as a human being and achieving something valuable so that's her view and the paper is really meant to be a kind of intervention um on that sort of approach and what i want to say in the paper is um i like the kind of perfectionist framework so i like the idea of thinking that what makes an achievement valuable is partly a matter of how much it kind of fully expresses or realizes capacities that are kind of basic to the human being in question. And what I wanna disagree with is the role that difficulty plays in the account. And specifically, what I wanna suggest is that there are actually two different kinds of ways that an achievement can be difficult. And I think one sort of way increases the value of the achievement and one sort of way doesn't obviously increase the value of the achievement. So in the paper I talk about um, this example that I take from Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own, where Woolf imagines what it would be like, what it would have been like if Shakespeare, William Shakespeare had had a sister who was sort of equally talented but not given the kind of material resources and opportunities that William Shakespeare had. And what I want to suggest is like, it might, just in terms of kind of brute difficulty, both William Shakespeare and his sister might put in the same amount of effort, they might experience the same amount of difficulty in writing poetry. But because of all the sort of resources and kind of material conditions that William Shakespeare is in, he will produce some of the greatest works of uh, Western literature. And in the case that I imagine, 
because William's sister doesn't have access to the same education and resources, she's kind of unable to do that, even though at some sort of base level, she's equally talented. And what I want to say is like, there is a way in which it's really impressive that she puts in all this work and she encounters this great difficulty and she exercises her will. But I think a lot of us would have the intuition that in some sense, her achievement is less valuable. And it's not less valuable because just because the product is less sort of objectively valuable. I think it's less valuable partly because she isn't able to fully realize what she's capable of. So because of these kind of external impediments, the very external impediments that make her activity so difficult, um, she's kind of prevented from fully doing what she's capable of doing, so from fully kind of realizing her literary talent. And what I'm really trying to push in the paper is there's just a kind of important difference between the role the difficulty plays in her case versus the role the difficulty plays in William Shakespeare's case. And so what that pushes me to say in the paper is that um, part of the value of an achievement comes from how much it sort of tests the limits of an agent's own abilities. So this is a sort of kind of like relativized account where I say, we shouldn't look purely at the value of the product, but we should look more at sort of how the value of the product expresses the abilities of the agent. And this, this is where uh, I'm sort of pulling a little bit from the paper that we just talked about with Aristotle, where I want to say it's sort of like acting virtuously. An achievement is valuable when it kind of fully expresses what the agent is capable of. And in William Shakespeare's case, his poetry fully expresses his literary abilities. And in his sister's case, it doesn't. And the explanation is because of the difference in their sort of external conditions. So conditions, I think, have nothing to do with who they are or what they're capable of. Um, so that's the kind of rough account. And I think sometimes difficulty is going to play a role in making achievements valuable. But I think we should actually think about other capacities. So I've been talking about like the literary talent that um, William's sister has. I think, yeah, we can think about sort of like artistic talents or capacities. We can think of intellectual capacities. We can think of physical capacities. And what I'm trying to do there is to sort of give a kind of perfectionist style account of the value of achievements that um, is more sort of expansive than the one Bradford offers and that can differentiate between the case of William Shakespeare and his sister. And part of the goal there is to make sense of how things like oppressive conditions or conditions of sort of material inequality can affect our ability to fully express or realize our own capacities. Because what I'm sort of suggesting in the paper is like, it's not a good result for Bradford that the more oppressed an agent is or like the less material resources they have available to them, the more valuable it, their achievement becomes. That just seems to me like a sort of uncomfortable result um, because I think, again, intuitively, I think we have the sense that they've actually been robbed of something because of those circumstances. And so this account of achievement is meant to sort of, on the one hand, capture this kind of perfectionist idea that what really matters is how much we're expressing our own capacities, but then on the other hand, also capturing the role that external circumstances can play in us fully realizing our capacities. So I don't know if that, if that answers the question. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think it goes a long way too. So, and I definitely agree when you say that uh, that, that result seems um, uncomfortable or counterintuitive um, of, of Bradford's. Because, I mean, she would have to say that um, so long as they put the same effort in, um, you know, no matter what their starting capacities are or what their final product is, the, the achievement is equally valuable. That just seems like it does admit to the sort of counterexamples you suggest. I think she sort of wants to bite the bullet about these cases. So I think she wants to say like, look, as far as the achievement is concerned, they're equally valuable. As far as other things go, so as far as whether it's a morally good circumstance, uh, we don't want to say that they're equally good or valuable or the state of affairs is equally good. Yeah. So I had another, I had a, I had like a case, uh, like a hypothetical. I was wondering how your, um, your approach would, would solve it. Uh, not so much solve it, but, but, um, analyze it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, we're imagining two people and their brains for both engage in a, you know, they both take part in a marathon. 
and you know they both equally test their capacities that they have now um you know to su succeed and we can suppose that they both succeed and right, right in the interim um you know says some world would it turn out that their achievements are equal or would it yeah so sorry are they equally talented or is one meant to be um at the, more at the talented start, yeah at the start they're gotcha. sort of equally talented but then one trains and, and then um, cultivates further talent and capacity that yeah yeah good so i want to say that the um the runner who trains more achieves something more valuable because what i want to say is like they both have the same kind of basic capacity and what they end up doing so the kind of final marathon is um an expression of how much uh they realize that capacity and so all of the training that leads up to that final marathon i think is part of them sort of um expressing or realizing that capacity so the idea is it's not just like what you do on race day but it's kind of every part of the training that leads up to you sort of being able to perform on race day in a way that kind of fully expresses what you're capable of so another way to put that is i think in order to kind of fully express your capacity or your talent as a runner you actually need to do all the training that you know and this is kind of like what elite runners do is they sort of like train in a way that kind of tests the limits of what they're capable of. So they sort of train up until the point where they're very close to getting injured, but don't get injured. Um, I think that is just part of what it means to kind of fully realize the capacity. And I mean, Aristotle talks about the difference between first actuality and second actuality. So the idea is um, take the case of like learning. So we all as human beings have a kind of basic rational capacity and then we can develop that rational capacity by learning things. And once we do that, we gain knowledge. And Aristotle thinks that having knowledge is a kind of first actuality. So we're able to kind of realize the potential that we have to be knowers. And then expressing that, so like using your knowledge to understand things, that's a kind of further actuality on top of it that is kind of fully expressing our ability to be knowers in the world. And I think something analogous is happening in these kinds of capacities where you can have a kind of basic talent, you know, you can be a really talented musician or a really talented runner, but you're not gonna fully realize the limits of your ability unless you do a bunch of work to kind of develop that ability. Um, and so developing that ability to a really high level is part of what it is to kind of, yeah, fully realize or express it. Good, yeah, I think, I think that's like intuitively the right result I, I, the idea sort of behind this um that i had was that i guess the, in one way there's the the achievement of the training and getting better at, at running and then there's also the achievement of the marathon but we can also construe that all of this as one big achievement in a way uh, yeah yeah good yeah I, like because i because if we just look at the achievement on the marathon day um and if because my thought was like, okay, they they put the, the, they had the they did to the best of their capacities, or they tested their limits. Um, um, you know, it seems to me that if we're just comparing them testing their limits, you know, and someone else who had you know lower limits testing theirs, then considered in just in this way, shouldn't they be like about equal um, in terms of the achievement? Um, I think that is a consequence of my view. So that's something I sort of embrace is like somebody who is just less talented um, and who runs a much slower race, but who has trained the limits of their ability and then run like the best race that they can run. I think, yeah, they achieve something just as valuable as the person who sets the world record. And here, I think we need to distinguish between like different ways of thinking about the value of the achievement. So um, Bradford does this as well. Like you can kind of think about the value of setting a world record in this kind of more objective way where it's just sort of like impressive that a human can do that. It has this kind of instrumental value for people watching it. But I think she's really thinking about a sort of agent relative value. And I think for me too, I'm thinking about the value is kind of agent relative. So it's really about um, how the achievement expresses the capacity or talent of the agent. And that can really differ for different agents. And again, I think that is a sort of intuitive result. Like I say in the paper, you know, if you consider the case of like um, somebody who has a disability or somebody who uh, is overcoming some other sort of um, barrier or impediment to running a fast race, I think there's something kind of intuitive about thinking that 
they're putting in the same amount of work and training and if they're really kind of testing the limits of their ability then that's no less valuable in this kind of agent relative way than somebody who's setting a world record but who's born incredibly talented right very good yeah yeah that makes that makes sense i i think another um helpful distinction that you might make is um like i, I might try to dis distinguish the an achievement as a sort of achieving roughly like the uh, as i put it like the an effortful satisfaction of an agent's intentions from the thing achieved that is the product of those intentions um or the product of some action more generally um okay so there's definitely going to be some use in talking about the the value of these things together but i think there's also a use in, in talking about the nature and values of these things independently um uh, what, do, what do you think of this of this suggestion yeah i mean it sounds to me um a little bit like the bradford view um when sort of effortful satisfaction of the agent's intention sounds a little bit like the amount of difficulty or effort um and my worry is that that doesn't again sort of explain the distinction between the kind of shakespeare william shakespeare case versus his sister's case um and i i think i agree with you that there's sort of like Sometimes what we care about is just like how hard a person worked or how much effort they put in. And sometimes what we care about is just the value of the product independent of what they did. And then sometimes we care about how much the product sort of reflects or expresses what they're able to do. And I think as long as we're sort of keeping those separate and keeping those, those kind of interests separate, then I'm kind of comfortable with what you just said. I just think at least for the kind of project that Gwen Bradford is interested in, where she's really talking about the agent relative value of achievements. Um, I don't buy the idea that we should be focusing on this kind of effortful satisfaction of the agent's intentions. Right. Yeah. So I guess in my like sort of very brief um, suggestion there, I'm not necessarily committing to a uh, Difficulty based yeah. view, but I guess it's like it's sure. sort of implied, but yeah, maybe there'd be a way to flush it out. I, I guess just the more general thought is that it seems to me that when talking about different quote unquote achievements or things that we call achievements, um, depending on the case, we may be thinking more about, you know, it from the agent side or from the sort of the result side. So, like, if, when I say, um, you know, the invention of penicillin was a, a great uh, achievement. Um, that seems to me completely, more or less completely independent from, you know, how much it tested the capacities of the, the subject who, who produced it or anything like that. But when I say, oh, someone running a marathon is a great achievement. Well, that seems to be very much tied to the, the capacities of the agent and, and what sort of effort and how they tested it. So, yeah, I guess that's maybe some idea, some reason to think that um, when talking about achievement, we can maybe talk about the the whole thing together as a package, like the actions and the result. But sometimes more with we focus more on one or the other, and maybe that's I guess that's sort yeah. of the thought I had. I think yeah, and I think that's right. So I think that is sort of um, consistent with what Gwen Bradford wants to do in her book, where she talks about the sort of agent neutral value of an achievement. So like yeah. Um, you know, curing cancer is something just neutrally valuable. So it's valuable, sort of independent of who produced it or how talented they were. It's just a really valuable thing to have in the world. Um, but then she also thinks like winning a hot dog eating contest is really valuable. And that's not valuable in this kind of instrumental way. That's valuable because <laughs> the agent really wanted to win the hot dog eating contest and them doing it was them doing something sort of like impressive relative to sort of what they were capable of. And so I think I'm really with you that we have to be really careful in specifying what kind of value we're talking about when we're talking about the value of achievements. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, and on, on on my approach to value in these cases, as well as aesthetic value, I mean, I guess to a degree more value, is that there's no um, like intrinsic value to things. Rather, there are um, things are valued by subjects capable of valuing things. And there are, you know, general facts about what sort of things subjects like us tend to value and so forth. 
And then so in theorizing about, you know, the value of things on my view, what we're trying to do is provide a, you know, explanatory, uh, explanatory, relatively simple theory that captures these general facts about the things we value and so forth. Um, I, I take it that you don't share this view on value, of course, but um, do you find this yeah. approach at all valuable, uh, uh, plausible or? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, like, I'm not sure what I think is true. <laughs> um, I think in the paper, I am really trying to work within the kind of objective sort of perfectionist framework that Bradford is interested in. And that is the kind of framework I find appealing. But I also do worry that it's sort of a bit limiting and that we shouldn't think that there's some sort of one set of capacities that all humans should find valuable or that um, should all be sort of oriented towards realizing or achieving. I think that's actually a limitation of Aristotle's view is to think that way. And so I'm kind of open to it. There's just a bunch of really valuable stuff out there. And then whether it's valuable for us is partly a matter of whether we value that stuff. I think I'd, I wouldn't go maybe as far as what I hear you saying, which is to say that there's actually nothing sort of independently valuable about these things out in the world beyond our valuing them. I think what I would want to say is like, there are features that make all kinds of things valuable in the world. And whether they're valuable for us, whether they're things that are worth us sort of investing in and trying to realize or promote, that's kind of more subjective matter. So like we should have some say in the kinds of things that we take ourselves to care about. And there's kind of more value out in the world than we could possibly have for ourselves. And so we get, we get to sort of choose um, the set, kind of set of values that we invest in. So maybe that's meeting you kind of halfway where you are. Yeah, something, something sounds about right. I mean, not that I uh, um, share exactly the same view, but it's somewhere in between that this view that I don't know this robust view that things are all intrinsically valuable, and I guess you think that there is some intrinsic value to things, but also you know this we're, we're interested in as well as what things are valuable to us and how they're valuable to us. So. Um, uh, question from uh, the chat on this uh, related to this. Um, he's wondering if if achievement is effort and it in, or at least involves effort and intention on the side of the agent. Um, does it still count as, a, as an achievement if I don't know the agent is unhappy in the process and result, and maybe they didn't even want to uh, perform this? In some yeah. Way? Does that does that, Interesting. does that make it not an achievement or does it like reduce the value of it or do you think that plays a role? Yeah, I think that's such an interesting question. I So I'd be curious what you think on your view because you are you like the sort of effort picture, I think. Um, I think on my view, it doesn't necessarily matter. So you could be a kind of tortured artist. <laughs> you could feel sort of compelled to make great art. You could be a kind of Picasso or Van Gogh figure and make this kind of beautiful art, but be sort of tortured and self-hating and not actually enjoy it or be proud of it. And I think it still might be true, especially because I have this kind of like objective perfectionist view in the background. It still might be true that you're kind of fully realizing your talent or, as, or ability as an artist and there's something valuable about that. Um, there's also something tragic about the fact that you can't see or appreciate that value. But I think that kind of is true <laughs> of us a lot of the times. So I think we often do things that are really impressive and that we have worked really hard to achieve and that really express our abilities but we can be very critical of ourselves and very hard on our achievements and fail to kind of be appropriately proud of ourselves and i think often you know you'll have friends in your life who sort of like encourage you or remind you to actually feel proud of the achievements that um you have so i'm yeah i'm sort of inclined to say like yeah you can you can be made miserable <laughs> by your achievements and they can still be valuable for you. And you can just sort of not be appropriately sensitive to that value. And there's something sort of sad and tragic about that. And hopefully you have a good friend in your life who can kind of like help you pay attention to or orient yourself to that value. Yeah. Yeah. My, I was thinking, I was trying to think of what exactly I would say to this or on this. And um, I think, I think one thing that has to be the, like when we ask whether it whether it has value um, or how much value it has, my, the first thing I um, I, I'm, I, I think to ask is well value 
to who, right? Because I don't, because I, again, I don't think in terms of um, agent independent value. And um, I think there are cases where, first of all, for the agent in question that, that is performing this task, it can have value or even significant value, even if they don't judge it as such. So they may have some ultimate goals or plans or um, commitments which for which uh, the completion of this task is instrumentally valuable, but they may not recognize that it's instrumentally valuable, but they may think it's, uh, may dislike it very much or something. Um, and so they might not judge it as a, a good achievement, but it, you know, it still would count as such given those facts. Um, but if they don't have those commitments, then maybe it wouldn't. Um, but then we can ask, okay, does it have value to others? And then we can talk both about the value of the, the actions itself and then the result. And I guess there's a lot of different answers that depend on the case. So yeah, that would be my rough approach, but yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different things to say and, and it, in part it depends on what sort of commitments we have on, on what value is and, and so forth. Right. Yeah. No, I, I like that question. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess my follow up on that, um, that question was from before was, um, how might we compel the idea that there really is intrinsic values to things like achievements, capacities, or or otherwise. Yeah, so what's sort of motivation for thinking that there is this kind of intrinsic value to achievements? Yeah, I mean, it's, I know it's a difficult question, but I mean, is there anything that uh, yeah. comes to mind for you? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think, you know, partly this question, I think, is bringing out a bit of that. So I think sometimes we're just wrong about the value of our own achievements. So we can be, you know, like, you know, I know a lot of philosophers who are so hard on themselves and who kind of don't see <laughs> the forest for the trees sometimes. And I think sometimes they don't see how good or valuable or important the work that they're doing is because they're so fixated on their own flaws. I think that's a case where they're sort of failing to, to see the value of what they're doing and even in this kind of agent relative way. And I think that kind of case moves me to think there's something more to their work being valuable for them than the fact that they value it or take pleasure in it. Um, I think, you know, another kind of case is when we disagree with agents in the other direction. So when an agent thinks that something that they're doing is really valuable and they value it, but we think that objectively it doesn't have value. So, you know, people give the example of like the person who counts grass or counts beans or you think of somebody who is a drug addict who um, is sort of has a kind of distorted um, or maybe self-deceived view of their own um, activities as being valuable. And of course, like there are fixes on a kind of subjectivist picture um, about how to kind of rule out those sorts of cases as genuine cases. Um, but I think, yeah, those are the kinds of cases that push me more in the kind of objectivist direction. And then I think, you know, I think on some level, these views end up converging in the details because I think, you know, you want to make room for the role of um, what the agent actually values or cares about on an objectivist picture. And then likewise, on the sort of more subjective picture, you want to make some rule for not including everything that the agent values as in fact valuable because the agent, you want to make some room for the agent being wrong about what they value. Uh, so I think, yeah, that's the kind of direction I would go. But yeah, I'm curious if you, if you just don't, feel sort of moved by that? Uh, I think there's definitely some some considerations there um, that uh, that are at least somewhat compelling. I mean, uh, when we I talked with um, uh, John Martin Fisher, and he's, he said something kind of similar, although I'm not, to be fair, I'm not sure how much of an objective picture, objectivist picture he was forwarding. But he did say that, look, when talking about like the meaningfulness of life, um, he used that counting uh, blades of grass example is in a, a case where you know, we wouldn't say that that's a very meaningful life, even if by the person's own life they're, you know, they're perfectly satisfied with that. And um, I mean, there's just different ways we could go. Um, but yeah, that that does, if we agree with that, that does at least seem to suggest, like prima facie, that there's some um, uh, something objective about uh, what, what counts as valuable or or, or a meaningful life. Stuff like that. So yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely worth contending. Um, very good. So let's see. I want to move on to 
some questions on another one of your papers on uh, oppressive mm -hmm. double blind, uh, double, double binds. Sorry, I can't, I can't yeah, stop, yeah, yeah. <laughs> stop from reading as double blinds, but yeah, double blinds. No, it happens yeah. a lot, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so double binds, as I understand you, are cases um, where an agent effectively has to choose between cooperating with some oppressive norm or resisting it, and both options ultimately contribute in some way to their own uh, oppression. Is this roughly correct? And maybe can you elaborate on this uh, with an example? Yeah, good. So, um, yeah, so the kind of basic uh, goal is to capture what is distinct about a certain class of cases where we're sort of damned if we do, damned if we don't. So um, whatever option that presents itself to us seems to be a bad option. Um, but there's a sort of particular way in which the options are bad to us. So um, part of what I'm doing in the paper is really kind of like Marilyn Fry exegesis. So she has this amazing paper on oppression, which is really interested in the case of double binds and in the case of um, what's difference between what's the difference between double binds versus cases where you're just faced with a set of bad options and whatever you do is going to come with some significant costs. And so what I say in the paper is that oppressive double binds are double binds that face victims of oppression where part of what an oppressive structure does is present an agent with a choice between an option where they can kind of cooperate with the oppressive structure and then face some kind of harm or punishment. Um, oh, sorry, cooperate with the oppressive structure and gain some sort of benefit or security within the system, but um, also kind of prop up the system that's limiting their um, access to options. Um, or they can try and resist the system. And if they try to resist the system, they're likely to face some kind of punishment or cost, which in the long run is gonna reduce their ability to continue to resist the system. And so the idea here is any um, choice that the individual makes comes with some significant cost because of the way in which the individual sort of prudential goods, so their kind of safety and security, is bound up with their ability to resist oppression. So the more you resist, the more you reduce your ability to continue to resist, the more you cooperate, the more you strengthen the system that's limiting your ability to kind of live your life fully. Um, and part of what I'm trying to capture is just the way in which, I think when people are actually in these sorts of cases, uh, it's really easy to, um, I think, kind of blame yourself or be really hard on yourself for the option that you choose because it's hard to kind of step outside and sort of see the structure for what it is and see that no matter what you do, you're to some degree going to undermine the goal that you're trying to achieve, which is ultimately to kind of um, not be um, beholden to this kind of oppressive, the, the oppressive norm that's that issue. So I think, yeah, you're, I'm trying to capture the paper is just the specific way in which you're kind of damned <laughs> no matter what you do in a way that is always going to to some degree um strengthen the oppressive structure that's kind of limiting your access to options or power right right so if i were to think of it like as an example of someone wanted to um was the uh was facing some like racial injustice or oppression or something they're, and they they were considering okay i have one option which is to um i'll try to protest it well that might lead to um them getting receiving various punishments may the the, the system might in fact strengthen itself and, and to deal with those sorts of protests and, and therefore become more solid. you know stuff like that might happen or they could you know not resist and the the the, the system in which these sort of oppressive norms uh, exist might flourish and, and, and increase, and so either way, they they have a, um, they're going to get oppressed, and 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 they might become more oppressed by the, by their actions. Is that maybe a, a good example. Yeah, yeah, I think that's good. I mean, I think yeah, that is exactly the kind of case that I'm interested in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, part part of what you're really bringing out is like there's just no good option, um, and even the best, you know, I think they're 
there is probably in every case kind of all things considered best option but even the very best option is going to to some degree undermine yeah the the sort of goal of the agent to resist oppression or to not be sort of subject to oppression right right good and and on like oppression and oppressive structures themselves um you mentioned in that paper that you want to be as you know about as neutral as possible about the nature of those things i mean you have to have some positive idea about um what they are in order to discuss them in this way do you have a preferred approach uh like or maybe we should just like appeal more or less to intuition or or, or appeal to cases um uh, that we agree to classify as such yeah i mean I don't, you know, I'd be curious if you think that there's something sort of important at stake in sort of um, picking a particular uh, account of oppression. So I sort of want to want to identify with roughly the kind of Marilyn Fry picture where oppression is sort of identity based. So you're oppressed in virtue of being a member of some marginalized group. Um, and that oppression in some way reinforces a kind of existing power structure amongst different identities. And then, of course, you know, I think um, this becomes complicated when we think about sort of intersectional identities. But that's the, the rough picture. And I do really want to focus on the sort of role of structures in this. So I don't want to think about oppression in terms of sort of like, um, as comes out in the paper, right? So I don't think that double binds exist because somebody's sort of intentionally putting somebody in a double bind position i think it's really a feature of the ways in which a person's identity interacts with a particular kind of choice situation that creates this structure um so i think it's as much as i need for what i'm interested in, in the paper and then beyond that i think as you say i'm sort of um trying to appeal to examples that i think are just fairly intuitive and that would get um that wouldn't seem too controversial to the reader. But I also think nothing hangs so much on the particular example. So if there was an example that somebody didn't think was a good example of oppression, I think they're sort of free to substitute their own example. Um, I think for somebody who's sort of very skeptical about the existence of oppressive structures, that's a point where, yeah, that's kind of beyond what I'm sort of concerned to do in the paper to argue for that. Um, but yeah, I, I would be curious if you think that, th that there is some important um, work being done by assuming a particular account of oppression. No, I think you're probably right. I mean, at least for the purposes of, uh, of your paper, that what you gave there is, right. uh, is uh, good enough. Yeah, I think that's, it seems reasonable to me. Um, so we had a couple of questions from someone in the chat on this paper, and he, he says, uh, I really liked your your characterization in general, and you had two questions. So I'll start with this, the first one. Um, you talk about a case of a teenage girl, um, a subset of the heterosexual woman type case from Fry, who looks a lot more like the classic or original double bind use case, despite having their relevant impressive feature, and give I think a pretty convincing account of how this can fit into your model. Um, but it, but could it not also quite simply not? <laughs> that is, do we think that some token instances of, instances of the heterosexual woman case aren't simply going to look distinct from the sort of model you're describing? And more generally, could we have a plurality of sorts of oppressive double bind? Uh, this isn't to, to dismiss your sort of case, which I think looks rather central, but I'm wondering if there might be a risk of overfitting to certain cases. And that is, uh, that's written down in the chat there if you want to. Uh, in case it, <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, good. I mean, well, I'm not sure I, I fully um, understand the question, but I think I think so. Like, I really like this way of pushing on the paper um, because one one way that you might be worried about the paper is like the account kind of is too explanatory. <laughs> so we can always kind of find an oppressive norm at issue that's going to put an agent in this kind of choice situation. Like, I think one sort of both virtue and vice of my account is that double binds are kind of everywhere. Um, if we're really looking for them, we can see them in all kinds of choice situations that we're making all the time. Um, and you, yeah, you might worry that that's, um, so I don't know if this is the worry at, at the end of this question about the risk of overfitting to certain cases. I think there is that worry of just sort of 
being too explanatory or kind of overgeneralizing. And then I take it there's also this worry that sometimes, um, yeah, uh, it's, I'm not sure if this is the worry, but the worry might be that not every teenage girl is going to face this kind of double bind in the kind of situation that I'm describing. And so maybe the account is being sort of like overly predictive about when and how an individual might face a double bind. Um, I'm not sure if that's sort of capturing um, capturing what the, um, this question is asking. I think, you know, I think those are real worries to have. And here, I kind of, as far as this sort of, is the account too explanatory? I mean, my first instinct is a bit to sort of bite the bullet. Like, I think I want to say, yeah, double bonds really are everywhere. Some of them are much more sort of severe and costly to an individual than others. Right. Um, that doesn't seem to be, I, it's not obvious to me why that's a problem for the account. Um, because I think, um, you know, similar to the ways we might think about something like adaptive preferences. I think it seems plausible to me that we face um, worries about adaptive preferences all the time. And some of them we should be really concerned about and some of them actually don't seem very concerning. Uh, so that's what I'm sort of inclined to say, but again, I would be sort of curious. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's part of what you said there, I guess, to the issue, like if you think that, uh, double binds are, are fairly ubiquitous, but, you know, maybe many of them are not very severe relative to others. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So they're not maybe so worrying or, or, or maybe we, you know, just tacitly think that there are no such cases um, uh, all over the place, just because they're so insignificant, but they really are there if they're insignificant. Um, yeah, I'm also not sure exactly if that um, is part of the worry of the question, but um, yeah. And I think that's good. If, if he has the, something to say in chat, I can, you can follow up on that. But for, for now, I'll ask his second question. Uh, he says, while reading the paper, I got to thinking uh, about the notion of homeostasis, uh, this idea of self-preserving structures and systems. And I wonder if the model of oppressive double binds you develop doesn't lend itself to a view of oppressive cultures, societies, systems um, as homeostatic and self-preserving in general, since, as you say, oppression is furthered in one way or another, no matter what you do, um, you're sort of slotted into an oppressive uh, an oppressed position or interplaying an oppressed uh, role in either case. Uh, right. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure I, I, I followed that, but does that make sense to you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I really like this kind of language. And I know sort of other people are interested in thinking about oppression in this way. So I think Robin Dembroff is working on a book right now where they sort of explore a similar kind of idea that there is something sort of like self-preserving or homeostatic about oppressive institutions or structures. So oppressive structures kind of adapt in ways that sort of maintain um, systems of power. I don't have much, I guess, to say about that. I think it's super fascinating and seems like on the face of it to be plausible. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think like there is a, there's a sort of way of hearing this question that's very kind of um, in line with what I want to say in the paper, I also worry about sounding like too pessimistic because I don't think even in the case of double binds that the choice situation that we're in is like totally futile or there's no good um, that can be done by choosing one option over another option. So I think in fact, you know, it's really important for people to resist oppression. And I do think we make progress over time in resisting oppression. One upshot of the paper though, is that sometimes some of the work that should be done in resisting oppressive structure should be done by people who are not themselves subject or victims of those oppressive structures because they're not going to face double minds in the same way. So I do think like one consequence of the view is that if we really want to make progress on dismantling oppression, sometimes it's much um, more effectively done by people who are outside of the, the kind of double mind situation. So that, that's, I think, hopefully a kind of optimistic thing to say. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and, and on that, like, I mean, I take it that there's a few approaches we can, you know, collectively take, especially those not facing double binds, uh, to reduce double binds. Uh, one, um, I think you make a, 
a suggestion of this sort is to um, take care to sort of recognize where there are oppressive norms and be more understanding of the actions taken by those you know affected by them. Um, and another, of course, is to try to reduce or eliminate the, the oppressive norms in the first place. Um, how, how do you think we could um, sort of work at these uh, at these goals in, in, in society? It's like it seems like a very difficult task. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I really like what you said, because I think part of it is this kind of epistemic or conceptual work, which is, I think, really sort of um, clarifying the concepts that we use and making them sort of accessible to people. It actually can be really valuable. So I think I personally found the sort of working out for myself the concept of a double bind and how double binds work, like kind of therapeutic, like it sort of helped me conceptualize better why I was feeling so frustrated in situations in my own life. And I know, you know, I've had people sort of report a similar experience. And I think that's just true of a lot of the concepts that we employ um, sort of in line with Miranda Fricker's work about epistemic injustice and hermeneutical injustice. I think the more we have just like epistemic tools and resources to think about and talk about and communicate about um, the experiences of oppressed groups, I think the sort of more power that we have, even just kind of like psychologically or emotionally, and then I think, as you say too, like I think pointing out the role that kind of allies have and the sort of ways in which people who are differently socially positioned can um, work or sort of make progress against oppressive structures. I think that is, again, sort of important work. Um, and I do think, you know, uh, this is not work I'm obviously doing in the paper, but I do think I sort of have a hope that philosophers working on these issues can sort of simultaneously be doing work or um, teaching or discussions that actually do kind of bring some of these concepts and conversations to um, the broader public in ways that I think also should inform scholarship. Um, because I, as you say, I think these are real practical problems and not just kind of like fun theoretical puzzles. And so I think what we do <laughs> sort of up in our ivory towers should have consequences for um, what happens on the ground and vice versa. Yeah, that's 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 a good that's a good point. Yeah, um, good. I, there were a couple of other questions on this, but I wanted to ask something on um, something else you've talked about. Not, I don't think in print, but uh, you've also um, uh, talked about like how anger can play various roles in. Uh, yeah, and play various social and psychological roles, in particular in response to uh, like various injustices, social or otherwise. Um, could, could, could you briefly describe how you think about these matters? Uh, for one, is like is thinking in terms of first and second order uh, anger a, a good approach in your view? Right. Good. Yeah. I mean, this is exactly the kind of line that I take in in a paper that I've been working on now, which is. Um, a paper on anger in the context of political injustice, where the argument is basically to, yeah, distinguish between what you're calling first order anger and second order anger. So there I'm sort of appealing to a distinction that Maria Lugones makes, um, where I, I refer to the distinction as a distinction between what I call outrage anger versus uh, what I call reform anger. So the idea is reform anger is, I think the anger that that most people have been interested in sort of defending within political philosophy, where reform anger is sort of the anger that's in line with kind of Strassonian reactive attitudes. So it's the sort of anger that we feel when somebody within our moral community um, acts in a way that harms us or is unjust towards us. And we feel anger as a kind of way of temporarily distancing ourselves from the person with the hope that the abuser is sort of held accountable and um part of what the anger involves is a sort of demand for repair or reform so we're kind of holding the abuser accountable as a member of the moral community with the hope that they can sort of be reintegrated back into the moral community so i think that's a really familiar way of thinking about anger that again i think goes back to strassen and well before strassen what I want to say is that sometimes there's this other kind of anger that I call outrage that becomes appropriate in situations where 
the kind of dominant hermeneutical space that we inhabit is one where our first order anger, so the sort of reform anger is kind of unintelligible because the harm that's been done to us isn't conceptualized as a genuine harm or as a severe harm. So I use the example of a case of sexual assault on a college campus where the victim of sexual assault is not is believed, but the harm isn't taken very ser seriously. So she is blamed for the assault and um, the assault is kind of trivialized and she's told she should just kind of get over it and forgive the person who abused her. I think in that case, even though on some sense, on some level she's being believed, I also think there is a level at which um, the kind of dominant hermeneutical space that she's in is one where the harm that's been done to her isn't really taken seriously or understood as the harm that it is. And what I want to say is in those cases, um, first order anger turns into second order anger. Um, so the idea is second order anger is this anger at the kind of state of affairs in which a certain harm is not understood as the sort of harm that it is. Um, and what that means is uh, that the second order anger, this kind of outrage anger is not aimed at trying to get the abuser to sort of reform or repair any damage. It's actually a way of kind of like stepping outside of the moral community in which the abuser exists and trying to create space in a kind of separate moral community um, that's not about sort of communication or persuasion with members of the dominant moral community but instead a way of sort of trying to reach out to people who might be victims of the same kind of injustice and to create a sort of different moral community amongst people within the sort of marginalized group in question. So that, yeah, that's the kind of basic, the basic view is this distinction between sort of outrage anger and reform anger. Yeah, that's a lot of good points there. And um, I think like, there definitely is uh, some utility in, in, distinguishing the various purposes and motivations anger and outrage might have because like because oftentimes you'll think about oh this person's angry and you'll just um not analyze it any further or not try to understand the motivations or the purposes um or the causes behind that anger and uh, that can you know lead to some bad conclusions both politically and, and socially and about that person themselves so yeah. Um, let's see. I think uh, I'm going to wrap up in a, in a couple of minutes, if that's good with you. But I wanted to ask, awesome, awesome. I wanted to ask a, a question that I um, like to ask a lot of the uh, guests on here. And it's just a kind of metaphilosophical question on um, what do you think the, or some of the value of philosophy is both to you and uh, and wow. to society yeah <laughs> right <laughs> I, I wow. know it's a big question but uh, it's yeah it is a, it is a big question i mean i think you know my view on this changes in different moments sometimes i feel a bit sort of cynical or skeptical about what we really take ourselves to be doing and whether we couldn't sort of bring more value into the world <laughs> doing something else um and sometimes i think like what we're doing is so important and you know we're getting to the deep truths of reality and that people should listen to us um i think nowadays sort of in general i'm somewhere in between those things so i think i think about philosophy a little bit like the way i think about the value of art in general i kind of think about philosophy as a kind of art where um we're sort of like being really creative in our solutions to puzzles. <laughs> uh, we're sort of exercising a certain kind of rational capacity. And there's something just like valuable about that. And I think sometimes the product that we produce is also instrumentally valuable in other kinds of ways. Um, I think sometimes the product that we produce is just kind of beautiful. You know, we're just kind of theory building or exploring things in the world. Um, and I think sometimes it can be both. And I think that's very analogous to the way I think about art. So sometimes art is really politically valuable or aesthetically valuable. And sometimes it's just kind of crazy and weird and pushes conversations in new directions. And so I, I do think like what we're doing is, yeah, a kind of art and it's valuable in a lot of the same ways that other kinds of art are valuable. And 
the way in which it looks different from other kinds of art is just the ways that it seems to be constrained by some concern for truth. You know, the particular kind of meaning that we're making or trying to capture has to do with what we take to be true. Um, so I, I think that's the way I think about it. And then I just think like whatever we say about the value of kind of music or painting or film, something like that is going to be true about the ways that we think about the value of philosophy, both for ourselves and for other people. And then when I think about like what value I get out of it beyond that, I mean, I just really like it. <laughs> I like to kind of like think through problems in the world, both in my own life and in the lives of other people through philosophy. I like to have conversations like this one with philosophers. I love to teach it. Um, yeah, so I, I think all of that. Yeah, very good, very good. I'm thinking about all, all the same pages there. I mean, I guess I guess part of it you might say is that uh that uh, engaging in philosophy is a, to exercise a characteristically human rationality. <laughs> That's part of it, I guess. <laughs> um, but very good. Um, with that, uh, we're going to draw the questions to an end. Um, and uh, so thanks so, so much for being here and uh, taking some time to take my questions. I'll include a link to your, to your website. Uh, so in the in the in the description and uh, yeah it's been excellent yeah cool thank you so much it's yeah it's such an honor and this was so fun